Good day. I am so excited. Women's TV is just awesome, but it would be less than awesome if we did not have across from us the fabulous Miss Linda Talufera. She is an author. She's written uh, about 40 books, and um, she's done so much. She's traveled the world, and we have in front of us on this table some of her work. So today we're going to divide this into three parts. First, I'm going to let Linda tell us a little bit about herself. We're going to talk about her publishing, and we're going to talk about self-publishing, since self-publishing is something that's happening so much in our society today. So we'll talk about that thirdly, and then we'll wrap it up. So Linda, mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about your path, your journey, and how you got here. Well, first of all, Gloria, thank you so much for having me back on your show. I know the last time we were kind of talking about my life in general and all kinds of things, but now we're focusing on writing, and I think that we're going to have your, your viewers find out a little bit about how they can do it. Uh, I'll tell you briefly how I got into writing. I was an artist all my life, and, and you know, still am. But uh, when my son was born 33 years ago, mm -hmm. I decided... I wanted to spend more time with him, and I thought, you know, there's got to be a better way than, than you know, Wait, taking my portfolio. Time out. Yeah. You look like you're only 33 yourself. Well, so how could you possibly have a 33 year? Exp explain that to me in one word or less. That's true, Gloria. <laughs> that's true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. But uh, I wanted to find a way where I could have a career where I could spend more time with my son. And people had told me they liked the way I wrote, and, and some of them actually were in the profession. So I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get started doing this. And the first article I ever wrote was for a homeschooling magazine. My, my son was homeschooled, by the way. And uh, then five years after that, I started writing for the New York Times as a freelancer, and right around that time, I got my first book, and it's actually that one, the genetic engineering book. I remember this book so well. Yeah. Linda, tell us a little bit about it. Okay, well, that book, this is its second printing. It's, it's been in uh, print for almost 20 years now. Wow. And a lot of that, I, I think, has to do with my doing a lot of promo for it. And we could talk about promo, uh, you know, when we get yes. into people doing their own books. But I had heard that one of the editors at this publisher, Learner Publications, was looking for very controversial issues to be shown objectively from both sides. And even almost 20 years ago, genetic engineering was starting to be something that was, was very important. Mm. So I went out and I bought a book called How to Write a Book Proposal by Michael Larson, who is a literary agent. And it told me exactly how to put together a book proposal to send to an editor. And that's what I did. And they were just wowed because Michael Larson's book was so good and I followed everything that he said. And since then, I've had about nine books for adults or teenagers and 34 books for children. Mm, that's quite interesting. I noticed that uh, a large number of your books are for children. Mm -hmm. I see uh, the Polar Bear book. Was that your first book yes, for my, children? I mean, first, can I tell you a story about it? Because it's sure. kind of magical. Uh, I had taken a class at the Open Center in Manhattan. They have these kind of New Age, holistic classes. And it was a class in psychic development. Mm. And the teacher was a woman named Nancy Rosenoff. And she started out by having a table filled with little toys. Mm. And she told everyone, okay, we're going to start this weekend. Pick a toy that you just feel drawn to. And I picked up a, a toy polar bear. Mm. And we did various exercises, but it just reminded me that I always wanted to write about polar bears. You mm. know, I mean, I write primarily for adults. It seems like I've written a lot of books for kids, but that's just because they go a lot faster than my 400-page book on genetic engineering. So uh, what finally happened was I, uh, I spoke to a friend of mine who wrote children's books. Mm -hmm. Now, I just have to know, when, uh, she told me, call my editor. And the editor did not see me as capable of writing children's books because I had written books for adults. You know, editors see you in a very specific way. And so she said, well, what do you want to write? <laughs> and I said, I always wanted to write about polar bears. 
And she was in Minnesota, and so she, this is how they talk in Minnesota. She said, well, I'm going to knock your socks off. We're looking for someone to write a book about polar bears. Mm. Now, coincidence or whatever, but she said, call me back in a month. And when I did, she had no idea who I was, ah. and she wasn't editing that book. So she said, here's the editor, the new editor. And I called the woman and said, oh, I gave that book away. Mm. And I, I was really crestfallen, and I started babbling about... But I took this class in psychic development, blah, 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 blah. And so she said, well, call me in a couple of weeks. And this went on for weeks and weeks, and I finally gave up. Mm. And then she called me. Wow. She said, I'm giving you the book because you had so much enthusiasm for it. And so that polar bear book became my first. And after that, then editors saw me as being capable of writing children's books because they're not easy. Now, is this your second child's uh, book? Children's well, I've written book, 34 kids' books, so I can't remember how it goes. But this is the life cycle of a bean. What happened was an editor who I had met was doing a whole series of books. A lot of times um, publishers will come up with an idea, and then they'll find a writer who they worked with who, or who they know has experience, and they'll do that too. Uh, for instance, uh, this book which you're holding right now, Tundra, it was from a series. I did three books about different biomes, different um, places in the earth where there are certain plants, certain animals. This is for slightly older children, maybe uh, third grade, something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, could, I could go on and on. I mean, I, I've done a zillion books. And I do only nonfiction, though, because I, I think that's fantastic. And nonfiction is actually very big in uh, children's books these days, right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Well, that's excellent. That's excellent. I, I can't see what the world would be like without your books to help guide children along. Thank you. But not only are you a fantastic children's book writer, but you are also a great adult book writer. So you've covered the gamut. You've yeah. gone from children, little children, to adults. Also, you've done teens and tweens. And mm -hmm. I see the book that's near me now is That's this my book. Complete Idiot's Guide. Uh, that's 400 pages. And I love to tell people my war story. I had to write it in three and a half months. Mm. And I also did over 30 illustrations because I've been an artist all my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the illustrations are, f are from the uh, uh, cartoonist who they had. I did the more scientific illustrations. Mm. So, uh, but it, it, and I had to work with a man who had a PhD in molecular biology. He was too intelligent to write this book because the average person wouldn't understand what he was saying. <laughs> but I, I would have him explain these concepts of science to me. And then I said, well, I'm the idiotometer. Uh, if mm. I understand it, I can tell it to people like me. Because it's really important for the average person to know about things like genes and the genome and genetic engineering because it's affecting our lives. You know, yes. where there's genetically engineered food. There's a whole controversy about whether it should be labeled or not. I think it should. And we need, we need to, to find out more about it in ways that we as laypersons can find out. Well, a lot of what is being written today mm -hmm. is being published by known publishing companies mm -hmm. and some not so known. Some of them mm -hmm. are new. There's just a whole influx of publishers. Yeah. Tell me, how do you uh, find a publisher? How do you uh, know which publisher to go with? Or how do you determine whether you'll self-publish or publish, uh, have your publisher do the work for you and promote your product. Well, again, my, the first book that I ever wrote was uh, the other book that you had mentioned on genetic engineering. And that I, I had heard about from an industry publication. And I went out and got, again, Michael Larson's book, How to Write a Book Proposal. It tells you everything that you need to put in a proposal. You send the proposal out to the editor. I think that what's really important when you're going to write something is in addition to knowing how to write, you know how to act professionally mm. so that when you approach a publisher, they say, well, this person did his or her homework. They, they know how to do this correctly. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't recommend that book more. Um, actually, the Idiot's Guide was, again, you know, sometimes things happen in life where you say, you know, the, the angels are watching me or something's going on here. Because I had written that first book on genetic engineering. I'm a member of an organization called the Editorial Freelance 
Francis Association. And they had an event where the, uh, at the time, the managing editor of all the Complete Idiots guys was going to speak. Now, before he spoke, I spoke to someone, not to him, he just happened to be standing there, about my first book about genetic engineering. And he turned around and said, you know, we're looking for somebody to do an idiot's guide on genetic engineering. Wow. So sometimes, you know, if you're in the right place at the right time, I think you should be in organizations if they'll accept people who are not published yet so that you're around other writers so you see what those, <coughs> those uh, opportunities are. Mm -hmm. But in general, sometimes a publisher will find someone like me who has experience and they'll say, you know, this is what we're thinking of writing and mm -hmm. we'd like you to write it. Other times I write proposals on topics that I want. I see if it fits into their existing types of books. It's another thing. You have to do a lot of homework here. Find out who's doing what because if you, you write romances and you send it to a scientific publisher, it's going to get tossed out into, into the waste paper basket. Mm -hmm. So do your homework. Find out who. So you might even call and say, who's a good editor for me to pitch about this particular thing? Now the other thing to do is, and I know that you and your wonderful husband have self-published, as has my husband. He, he did a, a book called How to Get Started in Fly Fishing Without Going Broke, Crazy, or to Patagonia. That is a great title, and I and just happen to have uh, some of the other self-published books. Yeah. This one is called yes. We've Come This Far by Faith, and it is, in fact, the story, autobiographical sketch, the story of my husband, a little boy born with cerebral palsy, who had a desire of becoming a medical doctor in the world. So I say, you can't do that. You have cerebral palsy. You're disabled. You're crippled. Mm -hmm. Don't even think about it. But his mother's encouragement just promoted him, just as you can do it, you can do it. So he graduated near the top of his class from CW Post, graduated from Meharry Medical College, practiced medicine for 24 years, and in the interim, he met a beautiful, <laughs> young, vivacious, exciting, <laughs> Should I tell you her name? Uh, is she also intelligent <laughs> and well-spoken? <laughs> I love you, Linda. <laughs> What's her name? Uh, Gloria. Oh. <laughs> and the second book we did under Poe and Inspirations is, uh -huh. is a story of a young a man who was a doctor. He became a doctor against all the arts. And the name of his book is Yes, You Can. And it's his story, his trials, and his triumphs. And he worked right here uh, in, Long, in the Long Island area, and his book is just wonderful. He's recently uh, deceased, but uh, they named uh, a medical so society after him, which is the Arthur Risper Medical Association here, right here in New York. And then, of course, we have... Uh, a book called Fruit of the Spirit, which um, I edited, uh, mm -hmm. and it is stories of persons up to the age of 106. Wow. They are telling the stories of their lives, and when you ask them, well, how did you make it through the Great Depression? They go like, what Great Depression? I don't know, we just lived our lives. And they're amazing people because they just took life into their own hands, and they have this ability to make something out of nothing. Making something out of nothing. And it, it has great pictures of, ah! <laughs> great ah. pictures of them in the book. And uh, it's quite exciting because it gave me an opportunity to, um, to meet them. And uh, one such person I met when she was about 89 years of age, and she said to me, you know, I have this feeling, and I'm going like, what feeling do you have? And, you know, I thought maybe she had agita or something, her stomach. She says, you know, I believe that I'm going to live to be 100 years of age. I'm going like, how can anybody make that kind of prediction? Well, needless to say, on April 19, 2013, during the sequester, I received an invitation to her 100th birthday party, and it was quite a celebration. It was, it was just unbelievable. And when she saw me, she said, is that you, girl? <laughs> and 
and it was like I could not believe it. It was it was just awesome. But I, I this is the last kind of book I want to talk about, and this is it's the life of Nelson Mandela, and it has uh, the illustrations are just beautiful, outstanding. It's beautiful. Yeah. So um, sometimes we have books that are just filled with illustrations. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have books that tell the story of our lives. Sometimes we have books that make such great contributions. So I'm going to ask you, Linda, where do you think you're going from here in terms of your writing? Well, why don't we backtrack just a little bit about how I get my ideas? Would you okay, be interested great. in that? Yes. Yeah, because a, a lot of people ask me that question. You know, sometimes there's things that I really have to write about. For instance, I, I went to the Galapagos Islands. They, they have, you know, species that are endemic. You can only find it there. And I was so enthralled with this place that I told an editor I'd worked before, I'm going to write your proposal. And she fought for my book when, when they were in a meeting. But other times, uh, and especially not so much with my books for adults, which is what I primarily write, but more uh, books for children, since they, they go faster, they're shorter, uh, a a publisher will come up with a whole list of what they want done. They'll come up with ideas. For instance, you had shown my book on uh, how peas are grown. Uh, you had shown my book on biomes. They'll do a whole series of things. And they'll find a writer like me who has a track record for writing about um, nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And then they'll, they'll give me a contract to do that. So uh, yeah, but. Um, Again, you know, I, I, you had mentioned self-publishing. Uh -huh. Can I give you some hints for people who are interested oh, sure. in self-publishing? I'd love to hear that. Yeah. Now, I've never self-published. I've, I've worked with traditional publishers, but my husband has, has self-published, and I knew, know that you and... Now, may we know that tall, dark, handsome guy's name? His name is Fred Thorner. I have my Fred own name. Fred Thorner. Yeah. You have your own name. Yeah, tell me. Wow, <laughs> a woman with her own name. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I, I married him, I said, you know, I kind of feel like if I change my name, it's from the time that my father would have given you 30 cows and said, take her off our hands here. Wow. So I just kept my name. But... Um, I, I know a little bit about self-publishing from him, and what I tell people is, especially if you're starting out, get a good editor. Get a professional editor, mm -hmm. especially if this is the first book that you've ever written. Um, some people have never even written articles, and so they're very new to the whole idea of writing. And a good editor, it, it's kind of like polishing your shoes. You have mm -hmm. these beautiful shoes, but somebody's going to polish it so they shine. And that's what a good editor will do with your book. So pay a professional. You know, you could, you could probably find one uh, through industry groups like the Editorial Freelancers Association mm -hmm. and the Authors Guild. You can call them or go online and ask, you know, who can you recommend to mm -hmm. do this kind of thing? I know, for instance, my husband paid a professional indexer for the back of his book because it's a nonfiction book, and he did a really good job. There's a lot of things that you might not think about as a first-time author, and you have a lot to learn from people who have been in the profession. The other thing that I tell people is whether you're going through traditional route or if you're going with self-publishing is, mm -hmm. in my opinion, writing the book is the really, really easy part. The hard part is doing promo. Mm -hmm. Because if nobody knows that your book, your wonderful, outstanding book is out there, nobody's going to buy it. So there's a problem, you know? So what you have to do is find books on how to do promotion for your book. Mm -hmm. and so you're talking about the marketing end of absolutely, it? Absolutely, Gloria, right. uh -huh. because even if you're with a traditional publisher, even if you're the biggest writer around, they'll do a couple of things for you, maybe the first year. Uh -huh. But unless you're the biggest author alive, they have other authors to contend with. And if you self-publish, well then, you're your only author, and you really have to get the word out there. Now, when we were in the car, uh, someone mentioned that Hillary Clinton doesn't have any problems getting her book out if, there. If you're Hillary Clinton, you don't have a problem. <laughs> but everybody who is not Hillary Clinton <laughs> is going to have to learn how to do promo. Yeah, so you have to sort of... Uh, uh, 
come into this with, from a kind of spiritual sp perspective. Mm -hmm. Sort of like why we both have on yellow. Yeah, exactly. Well, actually, today, for those of you out there, this was not planned. This is just <laughs> great minds think a lot. Gloria and her husband came to pick me up, and we said, oh, my gosh, we're wearing the, the same color. Yes, so yes, something yes. is out there today. But right, Linda, there? you know you have that talent, you know, <laughs> to know where to stand and what to say and what. So I, I think that we're, I, I truly believe that we're spiritual beings having a an in-body experience. Absolutely. And I think that the key to success is being willing to know that there is failure out there and go out there anyway and do your very best. Mm -hmm. Here at Women's TV, we celebrate a few good women doing great things. So today we're celebrating a great woman doing great things. Linda, you and I, we've known each other for about 20 years, I would say. Yeah. And uh, I'm never surprised when I hear someone say, oh, Linda's doing this. Oh, Linda's doing that. Uh, singing in an opera or no matter what it is, I'm never surprised because you represent courage. Courage that women need to see. You're not 10 feet tall. In fact, I doubt if you're five. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't let anything stop you, stop you ever. I've never known you, and, and that's the story of your life, I think. Once you told a story of when you were in college, mm -hmm. and someone said, come and visit me in a foreign country, and there were 20 or 30 people in your class, and no one went except you. Well, I, that, you're close. It was a, a friend who I knew in Europe uh, who was from Indonesia. Indonesia. And yeah, he had, maybe he had more than 30 friends. And I was the only one who went. And I, I lived there for seven months. And there, there are a lot of wonderful things there. I learned how to do Balinese dance, which is kind of this kind of thing. And one thing that you told me that yeah. I keep all the time, the word blum, mm -hmm. and that there is no word no, you told me this 20 okay. years ago. There's no word no in the in their language. It's yeah. just this word bloom. Well, there there is a word no, but I I never had any of my friends use it. The word was bloom, which means not yet. So I so, said, you know, have you been to Paris? And the answer would be, well, not yet. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, I know it's it's a very beautiful way of saying there are always opportunities because yes. you see, Gloria, thank you for saying I have courage, but I think. The thing that I've always done is I've been open to opportunities because sometimes people, you know, they, they make their own boundaries. They say, well, I can't do this, I can't do that. Yet, of course you could do these things. <laughs> there are opportunities everywhere, but you have to be attuned to them. Now, I think the way that I got my complete idiot's guide by the managing editor happening to hear that I had written about genetic engineering, the way I got my first children's book by just kind of connecting with someone who was looking for somebody like me. I think those opportunities are always out there, but we don't always see them. We don't right. always take them. Right. You're absolutely right. And, and we, like I said, we make our own boundaries. Yes, that's true. I happened to be at a conference in Las Vegas this weekend. Mm -hmm. And there was this dynamic man who was speaking, and he said, we should all have a failure folder. Huh. A folder of things that we failed at. Yeah. And see what happened. What was the next step after yeah. failure? It's always success. Yeah. And I had an opportunity to listen to Warren Buffett, and he said, you should have two files. One of people you admire and one who have not been so successful, and you should do what the one that you admire does and don't do what the one who, who, who hasn't been so successful. Yeah. And he says, eventually you will become the person you admire most. Yeah. But again, thank you, Linda. And I want to say that this is a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. We have Dr. Daryl Wayne Pone, who is our sponsor. Mm -hmm. And um, here at Women's Television, we simply say there are a few good women out there doing great things, and we're open to bring them into our studio. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Gloria, thank for having you, me Linda. on. It's always a pleasure. <laughs>